I'm going to talk to you about the fiscal implications of lower productivity growth. Uh, I just want to start by um, kind of listing uh, the uh, effects of lower productivity growth uh, that are going to matter in terms of fiscal implications. So to start, uh, lower productivity growth is going to produce larger budget deficits. I'll talk you uh, through that in a second. Um, lower productivity growth is going to result in lower wage growth, and lower productivity growth is going to be, result in lower equilibrium interest rates. Okay, so let me start with budget deficits, and I'm going to show you a couple of charts from um, the Shainer chapter of the book that help illustrate the point. So this chart shows you, um, shows you the primary deficit relative to GDP, and um, what you can see here in the dark one, that's the CBO baseline uh, forecast for the deficit relative to GDP. You can see it gets a, a little bit larger, a little more negative uh, over the next 35 years. But the blue line shows you what happens if uh, productivity growth is uh, six-tenths of a percentage point lower per year. And what you can see is that it uh, makes the situation uh, measurably worse. You can see a much larger increase in the budget deficit over the next 35 years. Now, here's a graph that shows you how it translates into uh, the debt to GDP ratio. Okay, so first point here is that the CBO baseline forecast, that's the black line, the lowest line. You can see it is indeed climbing a bunch over the next 35 years. Um, but then if you compare that to the darkest of the blue lines, that's kind of the all else equal version when you have the lower productivity growth, six tenths of a percentage point. So you can see much steeper project, uh, trajectory, uh, you end up with uh, debt to GDP uh, being close to 175% uh, by 2042 uh, as compared to around 130% in the baseline. Okay, So lower productivity growth uh, makes the debt to GDP situation worse. Second point is that um, lower interest rates that should, our models tell us, should accompany lower productivity growth, that will help some. Okay, so the next uh, darkest blue line, uh, the third highest line, that's uh, what you get when uh, interest rates decline one for one by 0.6 percentage points. Okay, but the, it, it makes the situation uh, better, but what you can see is that even with a very aggressive decline in interest rates, 1.2 percentage points, Okay, that's uh, a two for one. Um, you can see that the debt to GDP ratio is still worse than in the baseline, considerably so, when you've got the lower productivity growth. Okay, so let me talk about implications for fiscal policy. I'm gonna start with the larger budget deficits. Okay, so here's where um, some thinking has evolved over the last couple of years. So there's been uh, recent research, including by my colleague Olivier Blanchard here at Peterson, showing that debt has um, small costs right now, given current low interest rates. And I think this is a good point, and we're seeing uh, kind of more and more papers to back that up. Okay, that said, you still can't have debt to GDP rising infinitely, or you're not going to have low interest rates. Um, so the implication there is that the lower per GDP growth means the rising debt to GDP ratio means that we're going to need to raise more tax revenue than we otherwise would. And the lower productivity uh, growth just means that we need to do even more of that. Okay, so more tax revenue. I don't think there's a lot of scope for cutting discretionary spending in a way that would be meaningful, given that it's already so squeezed. Okay, but it does increase the likelihood of cuts to income support and health care programs for older Americans. So there's another fiscal implication, which is that we're going to need more um, retirement savings incentives so that people have more private uh, saving to, um, to uh, bolster their economic security uh, in a world with lower productivity growth. Okay, going on with uh, implications, lower wage growth. The research has, uh, that's looked at why uh, labor force participation has declined amongst working age Americans has identified uh, lower wage growth as a cause of that. So uh, with lower, yet lower productivity growth, we can expect to see even lower wage growth. So that does raise the possibility that we'll see uh, even lower labor force participation, which would be bad for the people themselves, would be bad for social cohesion, cohesion, and it will be bad for our budget situation. 
So this makes a case for more fiscal incentives to work. Okay, so along those lines, you probably want to target um, either the groups that we're most concerned about expand the EITC, or the groups that are most responsive to tax incentives to work. So subsidies to childcare might motivate more second earners to come into the market. Lower interest rates. Well, I already showed you um, that they do have actually a mitigating effect on the budget situation. Okay, but they have um, effects on the scope for countercyclical monetary policy. With the Fed up against the uh, zero lower bound, uh, lower interest rates mean that uh, conventional monetary policy will be even more limited than it other than it already is. And um, this makes the argument for fiscal policy to do more of the heavy lifting when it comes to countercyclical policy. And one of the lessons of recent years is that we have seen um, political will as an, op as an obstacle to using uh, countercyclical fiscal policy or discretionary countercyclical policy. So uh, this argues that um, you know in a world where we don't have as much as political will as we'd like to use these uh, these tools, what we need is more and better automatic stabilizers in the system. Okay, so. Um, so far, everything I said has kind of taken the lower productivity growth as a given. Uh, I've been in the adaptation world, as Adam would say, not the mitigation world. Um, and that was the assignment. But I don't really feel like I can close without saying something about whether we can use fiscal policy in ways that, boost, that will boost productivity. OK, and here the answer, I think, is yes, in principle, with those last two words being important. Um, if we did truly pro-growth tax reform, if we made investments in infrastructure, education, research, we could make a difference and materially raise uh, productivity growth. Okay? The complication is that uh, yes in principle doesn't mean yes in practice. And I do think it will be much more difficult to achieve this goal uh, in practice. And I think the 2017 Tax Act is a good illustration of the difficulty in doing so. Okay? People recognize that tax reform was a good opportunity to try to put pro-growth uh, policy in in place, but as the chart that I'm showing you here, which shows you estimates from um, various academic or academic-like studies, studies that are uh, that looked at the effect of the tax reform on growth over the longer term, you can see very small effects. Okay, so the first bar, uh, the kind of midpoint there is below a tenth of a percent per year. So small potatoes relative to what we think has been kind of the decline in trend productivity growth. Uh, so uh, limited scope for tax reform, I will just say, you know, it would be great if we lived in a world where we'd see investments in infrastructure, investments in research, investments in uh, people, but uh, even the most uh, promising of those, infrastructure, where you do see bipartisan political uh, support actually in or at least in words, you really aren't seeing any action. So there too, um, I, I think the in principle is uh, more view is more uh, bearish than the in practice view. Okay, so uh, that completes my report, my remarks. Thank you very much.